Welcome to the Poisoner's Cabinet. I'm Sinead. And I'm Nick. And welcome to episode two of the podcast. Can't, how we made it to two. It's Already. It's crazy. It's crazy. <laughs> So this is a podcast that explores the lives of the great poisoners and poisoning incidents from across history and also creates new curious cocktails inspired by the tales that we tell. That's the bit I'm here for, really. That's that's what you're living that's for. What I'm, that's what I'm after. Nick is our resident master mixologist and I'm the wittering idiot who probably will die very quickly from reading the wrong label on a poison bottle, thinking that it's gin. You think most things are gin. How are you, Nick? I'm very, very well. How's your week been? Any poisonings? Uh, no, no, not that I've come across so far. Not so far. Not so far. It is early, early days. Yes, you've been surrounded by children all weekend. I have. And yet no poisonings. I haven't poisoned them. They didn't poison me. All is well. <laughs> I, I was in Wales. That sounds wet. It was. <laughs> not much else to tell. Really, no, no, that was it, Rita. That's all that happened. That was it. <laughs> I want to say a huge thank you to everyone for downloading and listening to episode one. It's been fantastic to hear your feedback. Um, there been some great comments, so thank you very much. Very pleased that we're now, at long last, on Apple Podcast. Yay! So you can now find us on there. Please do go and leave us a review. Um, write lovely things. Yeah, don't write horrible things. Write lovely things. That's all I'm interested in. Thanks to everyone who's been following us on Instagram and Facebook and been leaving us comments and suggestions. It's brilliant that people have already been sharing stories and ideas of stories they want us to cover. So, Nick. Hello. Hello. You ready to drink cocktails and talk about poison? I'm always ready to drink cocktails and talk about poison. Well, should we drink poison and talk about cocktails? I'm going to go with the first option, I think. Okay, let's go with the first I'm going option. Let's go with the first option. It seems the safer of okay. the two choices. For this week. So, Not Nick, this week. you're in charge of the story this week, aren't you? I am, which is somewhat terrifying. So, everyone gets to listen to me witter on. So, as always on the podcast, we have a secret ingredient that features every single week. Earlier, we revealed what it was on social media, and it was. It was peppermint. Peppermint! See, I've got a slight advantage this week, is because I've researched a story, so, and I've chosen the ingredient. So but I'm not complaining because I get to choose nice cocktails. <laughs> okay, so what have we got this week? We have got a flying grasshopper. What? I know. I've never heard of it before. Everyone knows the classic grasshopper. No. You're not. Um, well, probably more famous from Big Bang Theory if you ever watched that. Um, <laughs> I love the way you were doing quite marks. I know. Quite marks. <laughs> I don't know why I was yes, doing that. Famous for the Big, Big Bang, Bang Theory. Theory. That's a real program. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it was so a grasshopper. So a grasshopper is cream, uh, creme de menthe, and creme de cacao. So oh. minty chocolatey cream. Oh, minty chocolatey cream. Okay, yeah. I like the sound of that. So That's this good. one is minty chocolatey cream with vodka, <laughs> which is where the flying bit comes in. That's I think. where the flying yeah. bit comes from. So we could be entirely insane by the end of this. I'm frightened and aroused at the same time. <laughs> Because you can see the cocktail, and it's not your traditional looking cocktail. Yeah, I'm looking at it now, and um, there's a, there's a slight. There does mm. appear to be a slight curdling going on, um, which is not. Okay, a... that's not a word that I want to hear <laughs> when I'm about to enjoy a drink. Curdling. We will share a picture of the cocktail. Generally, I'm not a fan of the the creamy liqueurs and things, but I thought I'll give it a go. It... I think it's possibly looking a bit dodgy, which is entirely your fault. <laughs> Why is it my fault? Because I use lacto free milk. That's not my fault. Because you explode. No, I don't. <laughs> I just say that to sound cool. Yeah, I know. So you've got <laughs> now a lacto-free cocktail, oh, but God. still apparently made with cows. I was taking the lacto out, so it's yes. not like you've made oat milk with it no, or anything. No, that, that would be a step too far, I feel. That, that would be upsetting for all concerned. <laughs> so, yeah. this could be horrible. Um, <laughs> if it is, I might make something different. This, I love the fact that we're talking to avoid actually drinking because we're both staring at it. <laughs> I'm going for it. I'm really going for suspicious. it. Okay, then. So we are going to try the Flying Grasshopper. Thank you so much, Nick, for making it. I actually really like that. It's like an alcoholic <laughs> after eight. <laughs> oh, it's, it's so very, weird. It's very sweet. Oh, it's sweet. It's oh. a good sort of dessert cocktail. It's just like an after eight. It's like an after eight mint. It's really minty. It's really minty. It's we really want, minty. Well, we wanted peppermint. You've got we peppermint. Okay, now it's settled. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, it was so minty. It was like drinking a bit of mouthwash, but n not an unpleasant way. Well, then, I don't I, know how to describe it. I have a feeling I it. might make this again. And if so, I might dial down the mint. This was following <laughs> following sorry. recipe from Difford, so... But, but that had, what, one part vodka, one part cream, 20 parts mint. No. 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 What was the recipe then? It's three quarters vodka, three quarters creme de cacao, three quarters clear mint, a pastel mint. 
So not grabbing a bonk because that would make it green. Um, and then a one shot of green. It could deal with the dialing back of the peppermint. To be honest, it was quite a, quite a powerful hit when you first taste it because if you're not into minty cocktails and you taste yeah. it, it's like, whoa, that's a lot of peppermint. But you know what? My mouth has become accustomed to the flavour. It's actually pretty delicious. It's, it's pretty nice. What is disturbing me is the slight sort of residue that's being left on the glass. <laughs> See, it looks like sort of curdled milk or something. It doesn't feel like that when you It looks when like curdled milk at best. There yes. are other analogies oh, that yourself. are leaping no. to my mind. Yes, I'm sure there are. But, you're mm-hmm. um, but that's the only slight downside to the thing. It does not leave an attractive appearance. Yes, drooly goodness, perhaps. Drooly goodness, Drooly what? goodness. <laughs> I'm surprised at how nice that is. It is very sweet. So you've got to be into your sweet cocktails, but there's not much of it. It's not like it's a long cocktail. And One of those um... after a meal. I don't think will be half bad. <laughs> You're delighted I'm by really this. I'm really impressed. Really pleased. I'm really pleased. It's not an actual after eight mint, though. You do know that. But it tastes like it. it and it's like... got booze in it. <laughs> a huge success. Well, a success. <laughs> a success. A, a moderate success. success. It, um, Let's just say it's better than last week. It is better than last week. <laughs> it's all we can ask. The, the Almond Martini. The Almond Martini wasn't bad. It was that was really a smack in the face. Whereas this is more of a gentle kiss. <laughs> so while we're enjoying our delicious flying grasshoppers, perhaps you would like to tell us why on earth are we looking at peppermint this week well, in this world of poisoners? You will. We will have to wait and find out. As I tell the tale, this week we are talking about the Bradford Sweets Poisoning. Are you familiar with the Bradford Sweets Poisoning? I have heard of it. I don't know the story. This was actually a story that was also suggested by one of our new fans. It was indeed, yes. So great that we're actually starting it early on with some of the fan favourites. Yes, indeed. Oh, I'm intrigued. Intrigued. Well, it was a very famous case back in 1858. I thought you were going to start with, it was a dark and stormy night. It was a dark and stormy (laughs) night in October of 1858. Okay, so we'll pass the poison panic which is known in the 1840s yes i think in theory um still poison very prevalent and very much available yes and Um, still worries about how it's regulated so we have the poisoners register which came into 1851 thank god yeah it didn't do a huge amount of good as we are about to find out set the scene for me me. (laughs) you see take me on a journey take you on a journey it's getting really lumpy (laughs) That's the cocktail. <laughs> this is a bad journey start of it. It's it's, it was a lumpy, lumpy day. It was day. a lumpy, lumpy night. It was a lumpy, a dark and lumpy night. <laughs> right, imagine if you will, we're in Bradford. Oh. An industrial, a heavy industrial area in the north of England. Oh, I can picture it now. 1858. Full of cotton mills and ironworks and very industrial, hardworking area. I can see the smoke rising from the chimneys. I can see the urchins running through the streets. I can almost hear the oppression. <laughs> I'm glad I'm selling you the story. It's um, the, the cocktail has gone straight to my head. See, look, it's really dodgy. <laughs> it really is dodgy. Maybe it's the lactose free bit. It might be actually. It might. Is it the lactose free? Maybe cream. Maybe entirely that I fault. didn't make him do. He just chose to do this to himself. Because you would complain if I didn't. I wouldn't have complained. Well, I'm going to complain now. Anyway. My, my cocktail's lumpy. Anyway, we are in 1858 in Bradford. We are meeting a man called William Hardacre. So quite a humble chap who has a sweet stall in the local market in Bradford. Aww. Um, selling sweets to labourers and children. And he earns his living on a street stall day in, day out. Well, that's nice. He was, he, by all accounts, he's a well-liked chap. He's got a nickname locally of Humbug Billy. Humbug Billy? Humbug Billy. I think Humbug from the sweet Humbug rather than Charles Dickens' Humbug Humbug. Yes, Humbug Billy, evil beats children. Yeah. Humbug Billy from the sweets, lovely man with lovely rosy man. cheeks, wearing a straw boater. Potentially. I would I think picture what, him in a straw I'm boater. I'm not going to argue with you. Straw boater and nothing else. That's fun for you. Oh yeah. <laughs> anyway, William Humbug Billy, he buys his sweets from a local wholesaler called Joseph Neal, who has got a shop, well, not a shop, factory, a workshop, possibly. Not a factory. A factory might be a bit too grand for it. Um, so we're going to go with the workshop. You've scaled it down. Massively. Scaled it down. He has a factory. It's a shop. Actually, it's more of a hut. It's a box. <laughs> it's a box in the middle of the street. He's got a cardboard box in which he makes some sweets <laughs> in Bradford. But he has staff in his cardboard box. So it's quite a big cardboard box. <laughs> the staff are rats. Anyway, Joseph Neal is a sweet wholesaler. Humbug Billy goes to Joseph and says, I need some humbugs. I need some peppermint humbugs. <gasps> 
peppermint humbugs. See oh, what I did there? I'm starting to see now the journey that we're going on. Also, peppermint, <laughs> peppermint in humbugs. Oh, peppermint I, humbug. I, you see, I don't mind a humbug. A minty goodness. Minty goodness. It's not minty bad. Goodness. It's a popular street. I don't know whether um, any of our American listeners, if you have humbugs in America, it's basically a boiled sweet with peppermint flavor. With peppermint flavoring, it will be sweet and kind of a little bit sickly, but it will have a People minty know what flavor. Boiled sweets are. No, they won't know what a humbug is. Maybe I don't know. Anyway, I mean, I'm going to get a flood of comments now of everyone going, we know what humbugs are, you horrible much. woman. Pretty much. Anyway, he needs some more. Sold out of humbugs. Uh, it has been a rush. It has been a rush. He goes to Joseph to get some more humbugs. Joseph is also out of humbugs. Oh my it's God. been a terrible rush. What happened in this <laughs> year that humbugs were flying off the shelves? I know. So Joseph, he says to William, I will make you some new humbugs. A fresh batch of humbugs. You'll get the first batch that come out of the workshop. I don't know what to call it. It's a, work- it's a box. We've decided. It's a box. It's a- <laughs> you will get the first batch of humbugs that they- I've taken from my box in yes, the street. Yes, made by my rats <laughs> minions. Um... <laughs> Anyway, humbugs are made from peppermint oil, sugar, and gum. Binding agent. Binding agent, exactly so. But sugar, horrendously expensive. Yes, it is. Has to be imported from the Caribbean. Um, Huge taxes going on. Um, So, very, very, very expensive to buy. Wasn't sugar kind of like a status symbol at the time? It was, absolutely. Well, yes, certainly. Take it out at dinner parties and things and show off. I think you're going back a bit too far, potentially. Oh, I am. (laughs) That was like the 1700s. I think we're looking sort of like Queen Elizabeth (laughs) and her sugar. Um, Oh, yeah, that's even earlier. (laughs) So, but yeah, no. I'm still living that fantasy. I still think that, that sugar is a sign of wealth. At my dinner parties, I just bring out a bag of Tate and Lyle and hurl it at people. Sugar! That, that's sugar! Why, that's why no one goes to your dinner parties That's one of the many anymore. reasons that you don't come around. Anyway, sugar is very expensive. It still is a status symbol. So only the very wealthy can afford it in large quantities. Mm. So Do they to... have sugar rooms? No. Do the wealthy not have big sugar rooms? No. That they ride around on sleighs in? No. Okay. No. Let's... Move, move on, shall we? <laughs> let's let's move on from the crazy, crazy sugar room, the sugar room thing. It's the last time I'm making you a flying grasshopper. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I've lost where I was in the story. It's a lovely story. I have no idea what's going on anymore. It's, well, we've established there are sugar rooms in Victoria. There England. are no sugar rooms. We are not in. There were sugar Court. rooms. There was a man with a box and rats in it that was making humbugs. <laughs> we're blowing this case wide open, Nick. This is what we're doing. <laughs> right, sensibleness. Okay. It's a serious story. It is a serious story. It's a serious story. <laughs> Stop laughing. I'm not laughing. It's not funny. Uh, humbug Billy had gone to his supplier. Had gone to Joseph to get some new humbugs. Joseph yes. needs to make some humbugs. He had run out of stock to get around sugar being so horrendously and cripplingly expensive. Uh, a lot of people would adulterate their sugar. That means mix it with other ingredients to bulk it out to mm. make it a lot, lot cheaper. It was quite a common practice uh, back in the day, with many different foodstuffs, really. There were tales of milk being watered down um, and then coloured with plaster of Paris to make it white again. There was cases of bakers adding chalk dust to flour, again, to bulk it out, chalk dust being so much cheaper than flour. Really? Um, to make it go further. Oh, goodness. Is flour that expensive? Maybe well, I think it was at the time, because the amount of work and the physical labour that had to go into oh, to producing it, it to harvesting fields, to getting it to the mills, grinding. Oh. Ending, so transporting it around and things so and if there's any way they could save a bit of money by adding in some chalk dust to it then i mean we who's shouldn't to know we shouldn't be surprised just in this day and age you need to see it listed on the back you'll have an ingredients label that says 19 percent pork and the rest is just a horror <laughs> it's just terrifying things that no one needs to know about there was a commonly used adulterant um which was added to sugar it was called Daffy or Daff. Uh, it was a mixture of plaster of Paris, powdered limestone, and gypsum. What? Which is doesn't sound particularly appetising. No. All in all, fairly harmless substances. Plaster They're, of Paris. It's not going to kill you. It, Okay. I mean, we're not talking pure just pl- eating just oh, well, handfuls right. of plaster okay. of Paris. It is mixed with other stuff and there is real sugar in there as well. Oh, thank God. So yeah. it's not just that. It might not taste the best, but then you've got a hell of a lot of peppermint oil and things like that, which are probably going to mask the unwanted flavours of plaster and gypsum and things. Oof. So it's a fairly commonly accepted practice. Fair enough. Um, it goes on all over the country. I mean, putting things into perspective, a pound of daffy would cost you about 30 pence in modern money, whereas a pound of sugar would cost you about three pounds. Oh, my God. 
So there's a huge difference. So you can see how much cheaper it was. So, so how much of an incentive it was to adulterate your products when you can make such a huge cost saving. On and it's one. not a rich time, is it? No, absolutely. Everyone's living hand to mouth. If you can make a buck anywhere, you're going to do it. Especially if you're a supplier to a sweet stall merchant. Exactly. I mean, we're, we're, he's not living that high life. Exactly. We're, we're not talking about someone who's supplying kings and queens and the aristocracy and things. This is a <laughs> this is a chap on a market stall who's serving labourers children they're not going to complain if it's not very nice was a royal sweet maker Oh, there certainly was. It was a royal everything. <laughs> <laughs> so. a royal everything. <laughs> but this man was not one of those. This man was not one of those, absolutely. Anyway, so but he still needs to go about his business. He needs to make this new batch of peppermint humbugs. He sends one of his employees over to a local druggist named Charles Hodgson. I do love that word, druggist. It is an excellent job Dr- title. Druggist, druggist then, is a wonderful word. It's though. a wonderful word. It's not imaginative. It's like druggist and chemist. It's like druggist, chemist. Uh, we can't be bothered to finish it. <laughs> there should yeah. be more druggists around. There should. I, I'm. I am quite curious as why it lost favour. <laughs> <Can I try? laughs> I'm starting to hear it now. Actually, in how you say uh, it out well, loud. Yes. I'm selling drugs. Give me my drugs, druggist. Give me my drugs. Anyway, the member of staff whose name was James, by the way, uh, goes to Charles to buy the daffy to make the new humbugs. Indeed. Uh, when James gets to the shop, he's told that Charles Hodgson is ill and he can't be served and he needs to come back in a couple of days when Charles is back on his feet again. However, James is a persistent chap, shall we say, hmm. um, and insists that he must get his daffy. He's, well, certainly, there's, there's a demand for humbugs. Demand. He's got, his boss has got customers who want to buy these humbugs. He needs this daffy now. He People can't. are rending their garments in the street screaming, humbugs! Again with the drama. I know. <laughs> so it is with reluctance that uh, William Goddard, our druggist, instructs his new assistant, a quite inexperienced chap, to serve James and give him the products that he's after, give him his daffy mm. um he tells his assistant exactly where this cask is located uh it's up in the cellar up in the cellar it's up in the cellar <laughs> it's, it's in a barrel in the cellar upstairs Obvi- obviously a really popular product <laughs> that they keep it in the cellar the assistant goes down to get the 12 pounds of daffy 12 pounds of daffy uh, it's a quite a hefty amount uh, that james is after as we said not the most experienced perhaps not the most bright of assistants Oh God. There are two casks next to each other. Oh God! Both with white, innocuous enough looking powders. Perhaps even our druggist, not the most organised of chaps. There appears to be a slight mix up with the labels. Oh God! Which is not what you're after. So there's just a cellar. There's a cellar with filled with th- random barrels of, of white powder. Of white powder. <laughs> I'm starting to see why druggists fell out of favour, actually. <laughs> yes, indeed. So, actually, it sounds like a lot of druggists today, actually. <laughs> Here's my cellar with random white powder in there. Take a pick. Sounds like a great place. Anyway, James, we're well, very happy now. He's been persistent. He's persuaded. He's got his master's purchase. Oh. He walks out of the shop with 12 pounds of arsenic trioxide. <gasps> and we come to our poison of the week. And it's arsenic! <laughs> it's arsenic! Should we, should we have bells and... Klaxons! Klaxons and... Arsenic klaxon. Is it maybe the most famous, the most popular, dare we say? Well, certainly of the period, absolutely. I think arsenic's going to figure a lot in this podcast. I think but it will. first arsenic! The first arsenic poison. Yay! I mean, we shouldn't be cheering for people dying! We probably, we probably shouldn't. We probably shouldn't. But arsenic, yay! So, Nick... Imagine stomach pains so sharp that it seems like rats are gnawing at your insides. The pain is accompanied by a thirst almost impossible to quench with loss of bowel control and a violent vomiting and retching. Vomit and feces stain you, your bed and the floor around you. Your family cannot wash the linen quickly enough to keep it clean and the air in the room in which you lie is utterly foul. You have a few hours to live. Perhaps a few days, but despite the best efforts of your doctor, you will die. See, that sounds lovely. That is a description that of the effects arsenic. 
of arsenic poisoning taken by poison lives english poisoners and their victims Catherine watson a wonderful book by the way we will cover all the different elements and chemical compounds i suppose of arsenic much more in this podcast because you know that we can talk about it for hours and at length but really arsenic highly poisonous white powder um arsenic trox- trioxide yes that's trioxide the one. is a byproduct of the metal industries arsenic itself um, is still used in um, some medical practices. I believe it's still used I think in it's some still medicine. Used as a cancer treatment in some places. Indeed. So arsenic can be quite beneficial, but arsenic troxide was used. Um, primarily by the victorians for rat poison it was also used by farmers they used it to dip sheep to get rid of any of the um, parasites in their wool um it had a quite a sweet taste if you took it neat but if you mixed it in with any other ingredients you really wouldn't be any the wiser which is one of the reasons why so what happens if you mix it in with peppermint <gasps> you're probably not going to notice anything at all surely not indeed back to our story right so james and his newly acquired 12 pounds of arsenic go back to joseph workshop and joseph gets stuck in making a new batch of humbugs completely oblivious and they wouldn't know would they they wouldn't know they're completely oblivious to what he's got is something really not what he ordered and he's using 12 pounds of arsenic 12 pounds of arsenic for sweets Yes. Oh, God. I don't know if the entire batch, 12 pounds, was used in this one batch, but a considerable quantity, if not all, was certainly used. I mean, it was noted that the humbugs did look a little different. They were a little darker in colour than they would have normally expected when they'd made them previously. They didn't really know why... It wasn't a huge bother. They didn't. It wasn't going to put off anyone yeah, from buying as, them. As we've said, this is not a high-profile supplier. Exactly, this is not a high-profile supplier of sweets. He's supplying to a market store. Um, He's just giving away sweets in there. So if they look a little off-colour, or if they do, it's just a little bit of a cheaper punt on the market, isn't then, it? Exactly. Then they, they take them and go with it. And also, they have spent the money that they spent to make these. They can't afford now to just chuck them away and they've, they've, they've got to sell to, them trying to save money along the way well exactly so <laughs> they've got to sell it's them it's fine so. it's it's fizzing a lot and it's black mm. and yeah. uh, my eyes are bleeding i'm sure it's fine. it's fine it's fine i mean in the end they ended up making 40 pounds of sweets oh god so that's a hell of a lot hell of a lot of humbugs that they have produced uh humbug billy comes back no. quite pleased he's got some sweets to sell oh, he no. also notices they're a bit darker than he would usually expect and being a bit of a a wheeler dealer market chappy no. actually negotiates a discount oh god on the sweets because they are not quite not uh, quite perfect good he's, for humbug billy well good for humbug billy he's still a very particular man he knows his sweets he's well, gonna get it right not so much on the quality control not so much on actually well. tasting one going hmm i'm dying indeed it was. well these are trouble times these, these are trouble are, these times are, you know he's a he's a market trader out there trying to earn his keep off he's gone so he's oh god. off he's gone they're on his market stall. Uh, his market stall is open dusk till dawn, no. probably later. Humbugs are flying off the stall. <laughs> that was an unnecessary pause. <laughs> it was dramatic. It was dramatic. It was a dramatic pause. Right. So we've got this beautiful sweet stall and people are flocking and obviously there's been a humbug shortage so they're, they're pleased so people people are coming back people oh, are going no. I need my humbugs. They've been waiting for their fix all week. Well, indeed. But then within two days <gasps> 21 people are dead. No. 21 people. That's a hell of a lot of people. 21 people. Including two two of the first cases were two, tragically, two young boys who, within hours, passed away. Oh, that's um, upsetting. Is, which is very, very sad. The young, probably quite enthused to get their sweets from the market store. No. Um, and were the first to die. Oh, that's oh, horrible. It's horrible. It is a nasty, nasty thing. Over 200 more <gasps> people taken desperately ill what 200 200 more it this was, is a popular store it's a popular store i mean he's selling them quite cheaply so they're going oh, out God. and probably in they in going in bags so people are sharing them around friends oh, yeah. and family and things so like a cheap round isn't it, well, it? Exactly. Yeah. Oh, yeah, have a humbug these, have a humbug because you can't are... eat a lot of humbugs but you're gonna yeah. have one and then like, oh, yeah, pass then pass them on, them on. Pass... The... oh can you imagine them walking through the streets hold it handing out please take a humbug and you can just say yeah, take a humbug everybody oh what a lovely gesture this has repaired our fractured relationship mother this lovely <laughs> humbug that has brought us together and then death Yes, there was a. I've, I found a quite an unpleasant quote from the a local paper. We have we have a descriptions of the symptoms 
of the Arsenal boys, and very similar to the ones that you've described previously. Great retching, vomiting, pain and burning of the throat, intense thirst, pain in the abdomen, and diarrhoea. So, not fun. But also, coincidentally, very mirroring of the symptoms of cholera. Yes. Which is initially exactly what the authorities thought this this was. Not something uncommon in the Victorian period. Absolutely not. That was one of the major problems with arsenic, is that um, arsenic became such a popular poison to be used and also became such a problem, even with accidental poisonings, because the symptoms very much mirrored cholera, of which there were many outbreaks during this time. So you couldn't really tell. But, I mean, we're actually quite lucky in, in this case that the authorities did actually catch on quite early that it it wasn't it wasn't cholera there were they they figured it out pretty quick we've come a long way haven't we Absolutely. so in 1858 they should have cottoned on quite quickly going oh cholera yes we've seen many a report of people allegedly having cholera and they've all been poisoned so they they figured it out that it was a case of poisoning and they <laughs> were actually managed to trace it back to william's market stall um, it's quite which, quick it, I know which I was desperately impressed it's quite impressive of the authorities of the time to trace something back that fast they traced it back to William's stall and then from the stall they traced it back to Joseph Neal our wholesaler and then from there on to our druggist Charles Hodgson and his assistant well I suppose um, if you've got victims lying on the ground surrounded by bags of humbugs it doesn't take a genius to well, work ab- out what's well, happening well absolutely and then one of the policemen's going oh god there's a dead body ooh a humbug yeah, but oh god death yes but we're quite lucky in that because they were able to find this um, this trail, the trail of humbugs. Trail of humbugs. <laughs> trail of humbugs. Um, so soon they were able to administer an antidote to a lot of the people who had oh. eaten the humbugs and who were desperately unwell. This but is interesting. So an actual antidote to, antidote to, to the poison. To the poison. Uh, they had interviewed the druggist and his assistant. They realised what a mistake had happened and they were able to administer... Um, an antidote what was the antidote licorice <laughs> I hundreds and thousands hundreds of thousands hundreds of thousands <laughs> quickly eat them quickly eat them this person needs cake cake absolutely. Yeah. cake or death antidote for everything should be cake everything that, it that should be, be brilliant. cake or just more or just more cocktails, <laughs> just that more cocktails. give them a flying grasshopper immediately it has cream in it it'll absorb it yeah it was estimated that each humbug contained enough arsenic to kill two people two <gasps> grown adults um, I suppose if you're sharing a sweet Ugh. Oh, so you've got enough for two. So you've got, you got enough for two. It's going oh, to so you're not going to be eating it and going, I've had enough poison to kill me. Have you, you have some. You have some now. You have some, dear friend, who I've always loved. <laughs> so, oh, enough for Well, I'm surprised that not more people died. Well, as, absolutely, as was I. I mean, it shows how quickly that these cases were reported, how quickly mm. that it was investigated, and that they had, obviously, some really quite smart people who were working on it to identify that it wasn't cholera, and they were able to trace it trace it back through the purchase of humbugs which is an incredibly <laughs> random thing to to link together so good on you mr policeman whoever you were i don't know your name you're um, a saint he's the most noble man in all of england a clever man um it was so they a... trace it back they trace it back to humbug billy poor humbug billy trying yep. to earn an honest living they trace it back to his supplier yep. to his box factory with rats they trace it back to the druggist yep who has um, whose stupid assistant has been mixing um, arsenic and and God knows what else? Well, quite. I mean, yes. I mean, I don't think it's entirely his fault. I mean, things. It turns out that things were labelled incorrectly. If that was his responsibility, <laughs> or the the actual the druggist Charles Hodgson, if that was his responsibility. But it was obviously it was a horrendous mistake to make. It was oh, estimated absolutely. that enough sweets had been sold to kill over two thousand people <gasps> if this hadn't been caught as quickly um, as it had been it could have been an uh, absolute catastrophe um, I mean William Goddard Humbug Billy was arrested um, alongside our sweet maker uh, James Neal and the druggist Charles yeah. Hodgson they were all arrested and put on trial and charged with manslaughter, um, which is probably fairly understandable. But not um, for poor Humbug Billy. Humbug Billy, Humbug Billy, yes, he was an innocent victim. As to, in fact, what I think was probably was James Neal, um, the the wholesaler who made the sweets. He, Indeed. He didn't maliciously go out to poison all these people. He was using what he was given. He was told this is what it is, and he used it. A big mistake by the druggist, Charles Austin, and his assistant, However, all three men were actually cleared of any wrongdoing, what? which was quite surprising. I mean, it was it was seen that this had been a tragic accident, terrible, Absolutely. terrible mistake, um, and that obviously much 
more stringent and stricter regulations were required, a barrel of arsenic couldn't be left next door to a barrel of something that people are going to eat. So it was it was decided that there was no fault for these for these men. Two of them I agree with, Humbug Billy and the wholesaler. They're not responsible for this. Our druggist, I think he probably bears a bit more responsibility. I, I, yes, I have thoughts. I have (laughs) thoughts. Humbug Billy can do no wrong. Humbug Billy is a saint. He's a saint, absolutely. Humbug Billy has been supplying the little children and labourers with sweet, sugary goodness. And he is a hero. The man with the weird box factory full of rats and sugar. He was just trying to make some humbugs. He was trying to meet some pie. The druggist... What the hell is he doing with his barrels of just random white stuff and mixing up the labels? What the hell? How does he become a druggist? Did he just wander in one day and just say, hello, I have a top hat. Give this man some drugs. Well, I don't think there was a huge amount of uh, formal training required Mm. in these things. I think it was druggists were seen as more of a you had a product, you sold a product. It was more of a a general shop than a than than someone with a specific skill in medicine or in chemistry i think up until now it had been very much a a form of retail Mm. so the arsenic act was established in 1851 which was uh, one of the measures brought in after the poison panic to regulate the sale and the purchase of arsenic specifically arsenic um not all other poisons it was called uh, the poisons register um, later on where you had to sign a book wherever you were purchasing um, your your arsenic from so enable people to track you know where the sales were taking place who was buying what only arsenic though it didn't apply to any other poison uh, which people thought may have been flawed but in this case obviously it's in place someone would have had to sign uh, the register and I think very very easily how that may well have been how this was traced perhaps quite so quickly back to our, yes. our drug is here. If how... you were buying and if you were selling, you had to sign your name so you mm. could see who bought it. But in terms of who was selling it? Who was selling it, yeah, exactly. So if you were buying it, you had to declare that you were buying it. But I think selling it, yeah, you were not just another shopkeeper. And if you had some particular knowledge or probably more experience than anything else of what powders what products were good for what things um i think that was very much ad hoc and quite just coincidental they're quite varying probably (laughs) throughout throughout the country throughout the town maybe you have one druggist who knew knew what he was talking about one druggist Um, in all of england um, please listen to me and then a few streets down you had someone who oh there's this white powder it looks like this white powder they're probably interchangeable um (laughs) But I'm going to make some money out of doing it, Indeed. out of selling it. So what became of this case then? So we have all three men cleared, two of which, rightly so, one of which, grrr. Yes. So, I mean, as far as we know, they all go back to their lives. I can't imagine Humbug's Billy's Market Store did a brisk trade um, <laughs> after this, unfortunately. Yeah, that's not a good day after, after you've, you've accidentally killed 21 I people. know they say there's no such thing as bad PR, but... No, there is. I think possibly... Murder and... Ac- <laughs> well, not murder, but, you know, killing Ac- accidentally killing 21 people i think is probably high up there on the this is not going to do your business prospects much good and there's billy there's a picture of billy humbug billy somewhere just kind of shrugging his shoulders going well what are you gonna do what are you gonna, know? What are you gonna do <laughs> it was reported in all the papers throughout the country really and it was a tragedy there was huge public outcry um, about this whole thing about how something seemingly so terrible so accidental could happen so easily mm. um as as a direct result of the the outcry uh we see the 1860 adulteration of food and drink bill passed <gasps> in parliament it legislated on the way that you could mix and combine ingredients um oh. and add it to food it also enabled the appointment of public analysts who were meant to go around and inspect um, factories and workshops and bakeries and all these places to make sure that the the laws were being upheld and that people were doing things as they should. Finally! You say that, but unfortunately only seven analysts were appointed for the (laughs) the entire of the country. Um, Everyone ignored it. It was a complete failure. Um, What started off with such a fantastically good idea just fell to nothing and was forgotten about within a few years of it coming in what really did to the end of the the adulteration in food especially in things like uh, confectionery and sweets was in 1874 when the sugar tax was abolished so sugar became affordable Um, it wasn't such a massively luxurious ingredient people didn't need to add daffy and all sorts of other things to it because they could afford sugar for being sugar 
That's tragic, isn't it? Because it is. It's, it's just literally came down. It came to down to money. money. Absolutely, money, and isn't really money the biggest poison of them all? I can't believe you said that. I know. I <laughs> that. I'm not entirely sure how to respond to that. I don't think anyone is. <laughs> but this act that's passed to say stop messing with food, Absolutely. going around and have regulation, such hope, such hope in all of our hearts, such, and, yet and it, such good intentions that just fails miserably because, because it's down to money. Because it's down to money. Because they don't want to pay for these public analysts who are going around so exactly it comes down to money and it makes you think how many other accidental poisonings were there how much of this was going on in smaller quantities obviously if you're not doing um if you're not looking at sweets and board sweets which are sold in massive quantities what about you know mixes up of medicines or or smaller quantities of of gruels and how many more cases probably went undetected must must have been a huge quantity but just from negligence as well. I mean, there, there'll be many, many a case that we'll um, explore in this series about intentional poisonings and those wonderful dastardly means that people use to do away with their loved ones or their enemies. But accidental poisonings, yeah. it just goes to show that the prevalence of poison at this time is so easily available that how many people just perished because of an accidental poisoning and when possibly the people, the perpetrators never brought to justice. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. And that's why I think it's interesting to, to do this as a an early an early episode in our, in our run um to show that yeah all these poisonings are not done by some thin gaunt man with a large top hat twiddling a moustache somewhere um <laughs> it's not well you don't all, know well, I mean, maybe that was I, what the druggist looked th- like <laughs> potentially he wasn't um, sick at all the guy really was upstairs going <laughs> they'll never know potentially i mixed the labels up <laughs> It, it could it could well be that he was an absolute mastermind of evilness. It could be um, a conspiracy theory. It could be. I, I, I know I'm stretching it here. You but... are stretching. You are stretching. But then again, you know how? Why would you mix the labels up? And why would you be so well, poorly it... storing your your arsenic trioxide next to your lovely flavourings? I think it just comes down to incompetence and negligence. Indeed. And just not really giving a crap. <laughs> Well, you're Uh, trying to save money. And again, if these things aren't being regulated, if you've got factories and all sorts of food preparation areas not being checked and not being regulated for how they're mixing or how they're storing articles, you know, no one's going to come and question a druggist, I suppose, or a chemist or an apothecary who probably has come from, again, in the past. You've got all sorts of weird things being stored in the name of science. Yeah, and these are people, again, who are probably have some level of respectability and some level of... People probably assume that they are more educated or more intelligent than perhaps a lot yeah, of them are. They... That's interesting because they're not qualified doctors. And we, yeah. we looked at the case of Dr. Lamson last week and you've got people, as you said, who are respectable, who have an education. They've probably had a career beforehand. They have some standing in society. But it's intriguing about druggists, really, and chemists of the time. You know, how educated did they need to be? How respectable were they? But you would assume, if you are dealing with chemicals, you would need to know that. No, I'm intrigued. This is something I'm going to investigate. Because I think it's it's fascinating that what level did you have to be at to become a druggist if you were just a a retailer who thought, oh, I can make some money selling this? It's something I'm going to investigate. Yes, we should look into it. So, the story of the Bradford Sweet Poisonings. Yes, I know, a jolly a jolly tale, an incredibly sad tale. A very um, sad tale, and an accidental poisoning. And an accidental poisoning of, yeah, 21 people, so quite major um, accidental poisoning. So Indeed, a true crime. Not all true crimes involve murder. The vast majority of what we'll a talk about... A lot of about, them do, a lot of them do. <laughs> ...will involve murder, but it is an important case, and it just goes to show how prevalent arsenic was, how easy it was to purchase, and how easy it was to kill a lot of people yeah. by... But just I, negligence yeah but i also think what's really interesting about this is how quickly the authorities are catching on absolutely to these things which is good for which is not good dying. news which is um, good news about if you want to try and kill someone with arsenic it's getting a lot harder to do unfortunately it does mean the avenues to other poisons are very much open. it does open us to a lot more other options <laughs> lots of options lots of options which we will explore in future episodes so we hope you've enjoyed our story this week if you have other suggestions of stories you'd like us to cover we have lots of material we're going to work through but we are always welcome um you to get in touch with us to leave us messages and say which 
famous poisoning story would you like us to cover? Is there a famous poison that you'd like us to explore that in more detail? Arsenic, I'm sure, will feature in the podcast many, many times, and we'll always fire the arsenic klaxon or ring the Victorian <laughs> bell of arsenic. I do, I do feel I need some sort of confetti cannon or something. <laughs> <laughs> that no one can see on the that podcast. No see, but I will but find both jolly. Perhaps we'll just sit here and go, hey. way. Um, we also need, uh, I think actually something that, that's emerged from last week. We need a point making muffler because what? I've noticed that when we really get into these debates, we start tapping the table <laughs> when we're making a point and it does show up on the podcast and I can't edit it out. I, I can't. So we need to have a, a muffler of some kind, maybe a cushion, right. Perhaps we just a wear point gloves. making cushion. No, no, gloves won't help. It will still bang the table. Okay. We just need, we need a big cushion. We need a big cushion. We need a big cushion that we can press when we're making <laughs> an making emphatic dramatic point, points an emphatic point then we press the big fluffy cushion <laughs> okay right exactly. you're exactly so we'll incorporate that st- uh, we'll incorporate that next week so sorry if there's just relentless banging on this um <laughs> I, I, hadn't, I hadn't noticed that at all. Yes, so. a banging cushion. Oh, no, no, that doesn't sound right. <laughs> let's, yes, okay. Let's, let's not moving explore on, that. Moving, yeah, on. No, moving on, moving on. <laughs> Do you have a cocktail or an ingredient that you'd like us to explore? We shared our secret ingredient this week. It was peppermint. Did you think of another cocktail that yeah, you could indeed. have used? Yeah, indeed. I'm always open to suggestions. Um, I like experimenting. So if you have another <laughs> peppermint cocktail, don't laugh. <laughs> Experimenting with a banging cushion? Experimenting with a banging cushion and a bottle of peppermint. <laughs> what a night. It sounds like an awesome evening. Well, um, I was going to say send us pictures, and now I'm really worried about <laughs> saying that. I was going to say send us pictures of your own cocktail um, inventions and your own ex- ex- experiments. It's getting worse. <laughs> it's getting, I think we should probably go now. Um, I think we should. We should lie down. But anyway, if you liked what you listened to, if you liked our ramblings, please do leave us a review on iTunes or Facebook. Get us up those ratings. Um, Please share. Tell your friends. Tell your enemies. Tell anyone who you want to poison. Any podcast that you listen to, it always helps if you download the episode and if you leave a review. So do that for us. Do it for all the podcasts that you love. Share the love. And we will be back next week with a new tale of poisonings and poison. And cocktails. And cocktails. Don't forget the cocktails. So this has been The Poisoner's Cabinet. And remember, your loved ones are trying to kill you. <laughs> <laughs>